I'm very delighted to have Martha Rivers Ingram here this evening, whose life has been a wonderful mix of corporate responsibility, philanthropy, and a dedication to the arts. We're looking forward to finding out about your journey. And I, I, I cheat because I've known you for a while. <laughs> yes. But let's start at the beginning. All right, where were you born? In Charleston, South Carolina. Excellent. 1935, go on and count it back. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it must have been an interesting time to grow up here. What was it like? It was rather ideal. It was, it was wonderful. And, you know, part of the joy of coming back now at my um, more advanced age is that it's so much the same, but somehow even better. The streets are the same, the ones I stumbled over when I was a teenager or a preteen, I guess, on roller skates. You know, they, they're still uneven pavements. And it's, <laughs> it's really, it's re very refreshing. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really fun to be back in a it's sort, of, sort of a different capacity because now I'm really quite tied up with this uh, Gilliard project. And some of you may know the old Gilliard is gone and we're going to soon have a beautiful new facility. And it's, it's really exciting because I'm having a chance to meet and work with a lot of people that were perhaps not even born when I left here to uh, move to Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I have lived for the last 50 some odd years and have a, a family of four grown children with spouses and 12 grandchildren, all living in Nashville, which is quite unusual for today's world. So when friends here say, well, uh, your husband's deceased. I'm sure you'll soon be moving back. And I have to say, you know, no way. I've got all these wonderful children. And, you know, it's sort of what happened one blind date in New York, and I've got this family of 21 people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now the, my first grandson is, uh, tell, has told me he's going to get married next uh, uh, October, I think it is. So uh, there's, there, there's a chance for still more, <laughs> you know, that 21 is, may possibly in the very near future expand. Tell us a little bit about your parents. I probably had two of the best parents that uh, anyone could have. They were utterly and completely involved. I think I need to say that my parents were married in, in 1929 and uh, they were very frustrated not to have any children appear and appear, you know, and so finally after six years, I became, I was the, the first child to come and, you know, I would have, you would have thought I was the most perfect human being. I grew up thinking I must have been because that's what they kept telling me. And then there was my sister, two years younger, and my brother, 10 years younger. So. I really, I grew up downtown on uh, Church Street, and my brother actually lives in the home now. But, um, you know, it was, it was just wonderful. I went to Ashley Hall for 12 years. Then there was no kindergarten, but first grade through 12. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just idyllic. You know, it was just, uh, I, I, there must have been some really rough parts, but I don't remember those. I, I just remember it being, a warm, sunny life growing up here. And then uh, my parents were very involved with our education. I mean, you know, I grew up hearing, it's all about your education. I mean, it was, I, I heard that every day. It was not go do your homework. Just remember the one thing we can give you, nobody can take away from you is your education. And fortunately, because I was at Ashley Hall, I had a, uh, there was a, a head of school then named uh, Miss Caroline Pardue. And, she, um, my parents had said, go to the best college you can go to. And uh, I didn't really know where I wanted to go, but there was a young man that I was at Princeton and he said, well, you need to go up to Vassar because that's a great school for girls. I, I ne had never even seen it. I just signed up and somehow got in. And Miss <laughs> Pardue said, I said, Miss Pardue, can I make it at Vassar? She said, oh yes, I think you can make it at Vassar. So she wrote a really nice glowing letter and. So that turned out to be a, a fabulous experience, and it was in New York that I met the man of uh, the, my husband, father of my children, and the blind date that led to 21 people. <laughs> so anyhow, I've, uh, you know, as someone said, would you like to have your life all over again? I said, oh, no, thank you. It's been, I've been so fortunate. I might not be as lucky the next go around. So. Talk a little bit about going to Ashley Hall. We do have several students here from Ashley Hall, along with our, our head of school, Jill Mooty. And uh, um, to be transparent, I'm also a graduate of Ashley Hall. Anybody else here? Excellent. Great, Anne. 
What was it like then? I mean, did it, talk a little bit about what you might have learned at Ashley <coughs> Hall in terms of, you know, it being a single gender school and did it engender leadership, you know, instincts for you or anything like well, that? Well, you know, I didn't think of it in those terms. It was just a warm place to go and uh, I I don't know it just it just seemed so comfortable mm -hmm. it was uh, today's world people would be surprised to know that we went to school in the morning I guess we had to be there at eight or so but then we were out of school at one o'clock for the day that was the end of it and we had we had we came home and of course in those days we had dinner in the middle of the day at uh, two one thirty two o'clock and my father came home from the office and then he went back to the office and we went to play at East Bay Playground. It's Hazel Parker Playground now. But, you know, it was just, it was, I, I, I can't uh, tell you other than anything other than it was just, you know, I think back on it and how could that have been better and I really can't think how it could have been any better. Ashley Hall, somehow the, the, the teachers seemed to have such interest in each student and the classes were, of course, very small, and uh, I really, uh, I, I really feel as though Ashley Hall really set me up to be able to handle Vassar. Vassar was still a bit of a shock. I mean, talk about culture being, growing up in this very protected area of Charleston, South Carolina, and a cozy family, and suddenly I was in the midst of all these girls who had been to a lot of boarding schools and a lot of. Uh, fancy places and then some that were just you know scholarship students but it was um, it was it was academically a challenge at first because the way of doing things was a little bit different from the way I had been taught but after a while you know I, I caught on and, and and then my sister came along the next year behind nice. me and so we were both there and she and I both graduated <coughs> what did you major in I majored in history but, I, it, but it, was, it was history, but it was history of a lot of different things. It was history of music, history of art, history of religion, history of philosophy. I, I guess my thesis was in American history, but uh, I really became fascinated. And, and actually, it was, the, it was Vassar and meeting these girls who were from larger cities, mostly from the Northeast or the Midwest, who had uh, had exposure to the arts in a way that they were not available here. I'd had piano lessons, I'd had ballet, but I'd never seen a full ballet. I didn't know why you had to hold your feet in those funny positions. <laughs> and I'd never really heard a fine symphony. There was a very, very modest one here, but you know, we were proximity to New York, made it so, I saw all those things up close and, and participated and I, got into the arts because I realized I had now these four little children, they were all a year apart, and um, that they were going to grow up culturally deprived as I felt I had been here. And my parents bristled when I said I'd ever been deprived of anything. They said, Martha, you were never deprived. I said, Mother, <laughs> it was not your fault. <laughs> it was It was the community that just and that's a whole nother story. I mean, it's, and I found the same thing in Nashville as here, and it all, no, I don't want to go into all this too not far, yet, but, but not yet. to the Civil War. Oh, you can go back that far if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, yeah, you're right. you Reconstruction. Of, when you think of the footprint of the Confederacy, all those cities, including Charleston, Nashville, Charlotte, Louisville, they've all had a very hard time maintaining their arts at a very high level. And it's been lack of money. The money went away during the Civil War. You all don't probably even know that there was a wonderful um, Academy of Music here. It's where the old Riviera Theater was. It opened the year before the Civil War started and then it was trashed during the Civil War. Nashville had a beautiful theater called the Adelphi Theater same thing. Nashville was occupied for three years. It was trashed and went away. And of course, all the instruments and all the, the things that would provide the, the music. And anyhow, that's a whole other story. But when people say to me, I don't know why it's so difficult in the South. And I really didn't know either. So I wrote a book. I read, wrote a book. I did a lot of research on it. And it's not the only reason, but I'd say the primary reason that we have had Charleston Symphony has absolutely struggled. Almost the light has gone out, but I think it's now 
with this Gillard project coming online, I really believe it's gained a lot of traction. I think it's going to be just fine if we can just keep it going. But um, that's a whole. Not, you you well, didn't want to go. Didn't no, want to. We do want to go there, but I want to go back even further. I want to talk. About, what did you do when you got out of college? Well, I had no idea what I was going to do when I got out of college, and I kept thinking I was going to marry the man of my dreams. But I had met him. I just, you know, we just hadn't gotten to that yet. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> anyhow, I came back, back here, and I went to work for my father, and your father was there at the, at the same time in the broadcasting business. And so I, um, <clears throat> it's really weird because my father, even, this was back in 1957 when I graduated, even then he never said, too bad you're a girl. <clears throat> he, just, he just didn't say anything about it. He said, look, you did well at Bassett, come on, come on and work for me. I'll teach you how to run my business, and if something happens to me, you can take over. So I said, yeah. okay. And, so, <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, it, it, was so, it was very unusual. I don't know that any of my friends ever heard that conversation at home. And part of it was that my father, I think, was an advanced thinker. But part of it was he had a lot of money borrowed. And he was in, in great fear of, he'd lived through the depression, you know, of something happening to him or to his health. So not only did he want me to come work for, for him, but he had also insisted that I learn how to type before I went off to college. He said, doesn't matter how smart you are, if you can't type, you'll never get a chance to show how smart you are. So I went to typing school in the summer when I really wanted to be water skiing and yeah. <laughs> fooling around with um, our friends, the Johnsons, the McCartys, no, that's what I'm talking about. But anyhow, he, um, he said that this is really important for you to do that. So, and it became important because, you know, uh, papers in college. But then when I came back, I could, he wanted me to learn the business by really sitting in his office as his secretary. And I could work the dictaphone. His secretary, incidentally, was quite ill and subsequently died. So I really became up, up close and personal about the whole thing. But it was, it was good, but I, I, there was something missing. So I asked him if I could uh, take the FM radio station, which was just beginning to some, have different uh, broadcasting from what was going on, on on AM. And I asked him if I could take that and turn it into a classical music <laughs> program. And all that music history that I'd been studying, I would become the disc jockey. So that's what I became. Was, I was a secretary during the day, but then I became a disc jockey at night from <laughs> 7 till 11. I learned how to manage it so that I could record the voice part, time it, and got an engineer to really run it for me at night. But at first, I had to do it to you know, learn. But the only thing he said, he said, yes, you can try that. But he said, you've got to figure out how to find advertisers. He said, you know, we're not a non-profit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, I fortunately was able to find a bank, Mr. Hugh Lane's bank was willing to uh, sponsor the program and I found there was an insurance company and there was, you know, there were a few and while we did not make a whole lot of money, we at least, I learned about business. It was like, for me, it was sort of like junior achievement. You know, I could learn how to, how it was all, because I had to make sure that the billings were happened and I had to make sure, of course, that the ads ran and the copy was right and so forth. So it, uh, I didn't realize at the time, I, to me it was just amusing. You know, it was really fun to have the all Beethoven program. It, it was from seven till eight, it was sort of, it was candlelight and wine. It was all kind of music to listen to during dinner and then it became kind of more heavy duty Beethoven one night and Mozart another and sometimes it was a mixture based on a theme. And it was really, it was, it was a lot of fun, but after a year and a half, this blind date circled back and <laughs> my father, well, I mean, he was glad, he was a lovely man, but my, my husband, but he was a little disappointed that I was going to move to Tennessee, but he was gracious about it. But then he had to hire somebody to do what he was planning to have. And I must tell you, <laughs> My uh, salary was very low. <laughs> I was living at home, 
but I, I can't even remember how low, but it was shockingly low as I think back on it. I, I mean, I actually do remember it, but I'm not going to tell you, it was too embarrassing. But <laughs> he's, he, he said, well, you know, you, you live here, and there was a, a part of the house in the back that had been redone so that it could be guest quarters, and that's where I live. So I did have my own entrance, and I did not pay rent. But nonetheless, I think back on it. <laughs> we talk a lot about equal pay for equal work. Yeah, work. right. I, I know. Yeah, we, we, we address that but quite there often. Were, there was no competition. Exactly. Because it was no, there was no measure because mm -hmm. nobody else was doing classical music in Charleston, South Carolina. Right. That's true. I love that first foray. All right, the man of your dreams. Well, my husband? Yes. Well, <laughs> so he circled back around, I hope. <laughs> well, yes, yes. He uh, circled back around? Yes, this was a long time ago. But yes, he was really quite handsome. And he was, uh, he, he graduated from Princeton. He'd been in the Navy. He was gainfully employed working for his family. And so, you know, I understood about working for your family. So uh, anyhow, we, we married and moved to Nashville, and then almost immediately, we were, we, he worked for his father, and they were, we were in the oil business, so he was moved to New Orleans and ran the filling station part of this independent oil company called Ingram. Everything so was called Ingram. We were looking for immortality, I think, even then. But um, so we we moved there, and then there were two children. Moved back to Nashville after that was sold, and had two more. And uh, it was a very very happy time. But I don't think you were a typical housewife. Well, I you no, got involved I was, in things was, outside of your family. Yes, that this is true. This is true. But. Um, you know, that was just what women did in those days. I mean, you know, if you were, if you didn't have to work, chances are you did not work. And, you know, it was just not, you, you worked really sometimes harder as a volunteer than you might have worked in an office. But, uh, you know, I, n nobody that I knew, no women that I knew worked. And see how different it is today because, you know, then later I went to work. I still didn't need to, but I went to work and that's, that's a whole other story, too, because I went to work, but I, I got no salary because my husband, it never even occurred to him that I needed a salary. I had an allowance, and, you know. <laughs> so, but your um, volunteers, your volunteerism within the arts started right about the time your kids were getting older, didn't it? Started, it started, yes, it started right, really very seriously when my last child was in kindergarten mm -hmm. and gone part of the day. And uh, I... It was, it was really one of those things, I, I felt as though my children were growing up, as I said, culturally deprived, and uh, it, it so ha it happened, I had been asked to go on the Kennedy Center board in, in Washington, and I saw that wonderful Kennedy Center that had just opened, and I was at a, a luncheon that a man in Nashville had, he wanted to develop a city within the city called Metro Center, his name was Victor Johnson, and he invited the wives of prominent business people. And I was one of them. I was one of the wives. And he talked about the fact that he had, um, was, there was going to be some light manufacturing, there were going to be houses, there were going to be various kinds of uh, enterprises within this. And he said, and over here, down by the river, we were going to put a performing arts center in, but the city fathers turned it down. And I thought, oh. And at the end of the lecture, he said, are there any questions? And I said, well, Vic, uh, that property you were going to put, where you're going to put a performing arts center, I was just back from a Kennedy Center meeting in, in Washington. He said, well, it's still there, but the city fathers turned it down. I said, well, would you give the city mothers a crack at it? <laughs> well, that was 40 some years ago. And uh, it took us eight years and a lot of leg a lot of a lot of work, but um, we got the the city turned it down. Not just the city fathers, meaning the business men, but the, the 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 city the mayor turned it down. One of my friends who'd been at that luncheon, who was with me, uh, going to the mayor who turned us down, said, "You know, I think that the the bicentennial is, for the United States is coming up. This was in 1972. In four years, she said." why don't we go and call on the new governor? Well, we had supported his opponent who had lost, so <laughs> I didn't have any access there, but I, another friend at the luncheon did. So we got her to be our third person, 
And we made an appointment and went. And he said, well, you know, we can't build anything out at this new uh, city within the city, this metro center. But something like that downtown could be possible. It would have to be down in the, the, the Capitol Hill project, the footprint. And so I said, well, why don't we put something like this? I was really getting excited over where you've just blown up that old hotel. And he said, well, you can't, we can't do that because we're putting an a, a office building in there. I said, a state office building? And they said, yes. And I said, have you ever thought about maybe lifting it up and sliding a performing arts center under? He said, oh, so then we wouldn't have to have any more land, would we? No. And that's what happened. I mean, you know, I cannot tell you, the light bulb just came on. And uh, I, I've since uh, heard, you know, I now know all these people very well because we worked together for so long. But I, as my two friends and I left, evidently, the the CFO for the the city who of the state who was there said, well, I'm sure, Governor, you won't have to worry about those little ladies. They, oh, you know, they'll be off at a party. They'll never think about this again. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so they they've told me that story because I drove them crazy till we really got it through the the legislature, and that was. It took us two full years of legislature, legislature's activities to get it passed. And then it took another six years to build. And it, um, so from 72 to 1980, it was an everyday occupation, definitely without pay. But we, we had to agree to raise an endowment for, the, for this performing arts center. And, and it was, was and is a three theater complex with 18 floors of uh, state offices on top of it. And it's been, it opened in, in 1980, and uh, it's, it's, it, and, and, there, and there is a state museum underneath that they had to blast all this great rock that we have in Nashville to, to do that. So it's almost like condominiumized with the, um, the state museum underneath, three theaters next, and then there's an elevator that goes up the 18 floors. So um, it's all worked together quite happily, and uh, it, w it was a struggle, you know, to get it uh, to get it passed and get all the funding. It was we worked in 41 cities across the state to uh, raise our money. It sounds like nothing now, but we had we were asked to raise three and a half million dollars for the endowment. We raised five and a half million dollars, and the endowment is now worth over 20 million wow. since then. And, but the three theaters, well, you know, one seats 2,400, one seats 1,000, and one seats 250. It's not very different from, if you think here, of the Dock Street Theater, Meminger, and now the new concert hall, the, the Performing Arts Center, really. And it will seat 1,800. So, but they're just around town rather than being contiguous, so, you know, or under one umbrella. But, now this is something that I didn't expect for sure. We had a soon after the opening in September of 1980, and it was a big deal. It was, but there was a, a, a convention of newspaper reporters, all of whom had something to do with reviewing theatrical performances. There was a man who worked for the Wall Street Journal. He came with this group. He was from Nashville originally. His name was Ed Wilson. He was the, the uh, critic for, for the uh, Wall Street Journal. And he was uh, there, and so of course I said, oh, Ed, I'm so glad to see you. I can't wait to see the lovely story you're going to write about our Performing Arts Center. He said, Martha, I can't, I can't do it. And I said, well, why? It's so beautiful. And she, he said, you've got nothing here but a roadhouse. You've got a bare minimum symphony. You have no opera, no ballet, no professional theater. You've just got a roadhouse here. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, call me when you get your opera built, you know, your opera formed and your ballet formed and <laughs> your professional theater. And I turned to some of my friends. I said, well, I guess we're going to have to get back to work. <laughs> And we now, and we did, we did, we, you know, we found the people that were, they were lingering. I mean, I sort of knew who really was, you know, wanting to do these things, but they had not been done. So we got busy with them, and now, you know, the opera is doing well, the ballet is, 
I mean, they're all doing extremely well, and our symphony is now a top ten in the country for uh, for symphonies. So um, that 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 that's been um, that's been very gratifying to see. But it happened so that we had so much activity that we could not really get it all onto the stages. So we ended up now recently building this beautiful, beautiful concert hall that's a pure European concert hall. It's like a shoebox, like the European style. And that's what has really given our symphony the boost that has made it what it, what it is today. But it never, it never stops. There are always either financial challenges or something, but uh, it's, it, I would say we are really in, in, in a golden age in Nashville right now. I just hope we can maintain it and sustain it. It's turned out that each of these groups, each of these arts groups, now has sort of a following, of, you know, a cadre of people that are really willing to work and to, to, to keep it going. And so I, I feel pretty good about it right now. But it's sort of like my, with my fam family, they're fine, subject to change without notice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you made a rather uh, big transition after that. You went from being a full-time volunteer mm -hmm. and jumped into the corporate world. I you did. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, after, I, after we opened the Performing Arts Center, and we were still I was, we were building these arts groups, but my husband asked me if I'd come to work for him, and that was really odd. But um, he said, you know, if I get hit with a private company, and it was actually a global company even at that time, and he said, you know, if I get hit by a truck, you know, it's not like my father, you could, you could do this, you know. I said, I don't want to do that. I want to go to the beach. And he said, well, <laughs> that will last about two weeks, and then you'll be bored, and you'll want to do something. He said, look, just come one day, and and um, I went one day, and all of a sudden, I started seeing things that, you know, needed to be done. And what he really wanted me to do was deal with the people that wanted to raise, wanted us to give them money to do whatever. And he said, I'd like to give you a chance to get even with any of those people that turned you down when you were raising money. <laughs> I rather liked that part of it. But, um, but still, you know, it was, I, I was telling, um, Leighton, Gwen, a little bit earlier, Leighton reminded me of this story, so maybe I'll just run this in. Again, I was in an office right next to my, my husband's office, and you know, I was, he put me on the board of directors, and he just kept saying, pay attention, pay attention, if I get hit by a truck. And uh, it, it turned out, you know, about eight, 16 years after I started, he did get hit by the truck. It was cancer, as it turned out. But, um, when I was working away, seeing all these people and doing the things that I thought would be helpful and useful. And one day I had a call, it was from the, the governor's office, and the governor since, it was Lamar Alexander, then you all probably have seen him, he's a senator, U.S. senator now, but um, he sent somebody over to see if I could be persuaded to leave the company and come to work for the state government. And, um, you know, he, it was to head up the non-university schools that were throughout the, the state. And it was something I'm interested in. I would have sort of liked to have done it, but I thought there's no way. Me and my husband wanted me to be ready to go. Whenever he wanted to travel, he wanted me to be ready to travel. I just knew it would never work. But I did say to the man who, who came, I said, but would, would you have paid me or was this a volunteer job? <laughs> and he said, oh no, we would have paid you da 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 da. It was a big number compared to zero, which is what I was making. <laughs> so uh, I said, oh, well, that, that's really, and I said, look, I, I really can't I, thank you, but there's just no way. But I could not wait to go in my husband's office, and I said, guess what? Lamar Alexander wanted to hire me to do the, you know, and he said, well, you're not going to do it, are you? I said, no, but I really like the fact that they were going to pay me. He said, well, you don't need to be paid anything. I said, I think I would have liked to have been paid. He said, well, what would you want? Would you want me to pay you? And I, this was after I'd been there for five or six years. And uh, I said, well, yeah, I really would. And he said, well, what would you want? I said, that, what do you, would they want to pay me? He said, this is the damnedest thing. I, it makes no sense to me. We'll, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll have to pay taxes on it <laughs> instead of plowing it back into our company. And I said, well, 
I'd like to do it. So I, that's how, when I started getting paid. And so, <laughs> but it was so odd, because it really had never occurred to me to ask for it, and it had never occurred to him to offer it. And it, it was not that I was needy, it was just, it the felt principle. really good to be paid. Yeah. And then, as time went on, and uh, you know, he, he became ill and was gone in six months from this very voracious cancer that hit him. And all of a sudden, I became chairman, and uh, he left somebody to be the CEO, and that person turned on me and my family, and that's a whole other long story. And I ended up having to fire him, and I became the CEO as well. And uh, it was very interesting. I, I, I can remember some people saying, oh, poor Martha, she has to work. I had so much fun as I got comfortable in the job, you know, it was really. And, and then I was picked up. Well, even before that, I was, I was on several corporate boards. It was just when women were beginning to get picked up by, you know, some large corporations. And so um, I was doing that and, and uh, the running, well, I can't say I was really running the business. I was running the team that was running the business, which is a, a kind of a different thing. And, and several of my sons were involved, and they were really very good. And now I'm glad to say is I, I stayed chairman and CEO till I so-called aged off the corporate circuit <laughs> after about, it was about 30 years, I guess. And I was not at all sorry to um, be off the corporate circuit, but I'm glad to then transfer my titles to my two of my sons and a third one took a piece of our business. And that's a whole other story. He didn't want to compete with his brothers, but he's got a major piece that he is running that's a private company, but not in competition with his brothers. And then I have a daughter and her husband worked for us for a while now. He is very much on his own doing well. So it's, it's really been fun. But then I got asked to come on, on the uh, Spoleto board a number of years ago. I think it was right after my mother died. I think it was about, about 19, 20 years ago. And after a while, I was asked to be chairman. And I, meanwhile, I was chairman of the Vanderbilt Board of Trust, and I was on the Vassar Board of Trust at the same time. I just couldn't do it right then. So I, I guess it was maybe in 07 or 08 that I did become chairman of the Spoleto board. And that was when I became so interested in the Gilliard because no matter what our budget was there, we missed it because people don't want to go there, did not want to go there. It's not possible now, but they did not want to go there. And so if we budgeted 50% of the seats to be sold, we sold 30%. If we budgeted 30, it was 20. It was just, so I went to the mayor, Joe Riley, who I've known for a long time, and I said, Joe, you know, this is just a terrible facility, a terrible situation. And he said, Martha, I know it, it was terrible from the day it was built, but he said, I don't have the money. And I said, have you ever considered a public par uh, private partnership? He said, no. You're the first one to talk about this. And I said, well, I think I know some places where we could get some you know, major pockets of money. And he said, well, that changes the whole conversation. So that's how I got involved in this Gilliard project, Well, which is wonderful for me because it's bringing me now back to Charleston a lot. And I love being in Charleston. It's a wonderful city. And it's so many great things that are happening here, not just at MUSC, the College of Charleston. You know, there's just so many exciting things happening here. So I'm really thrilled to have a chance to interact in the city again. And, you know, when I get back, it's almost as though I never left. Yeah. As I said, the same sidewalks are bumpy and lumpy. <laughs> and <laughs> I, can we go back to the corporate world for just a minute? Sure. Because I think that there's a lot of interest these days on around that mm -hmm. whole issue of more women, more diversity on corporate boards, more women, more diversity in senior management. What was the culture like in, in your corporate world? I mean, did, did you feel any, I mean, obviously you were the, the wife of the president and then you were the president yourself, but what was the culture there for women and did you ever feel a well, bias? W well, not really, you know, it's, I, it was almost reversed. It was almost as though, you know, let's give her a chance. I mean, when I was on the bank board, I remember uh, what became Nation, Nations Bank became Bank of America. I was on the, the local board and I just remember being asked to be head of the audit committee. 
thought, I'm a history major. I don't know that I know much about this, but I thought, I did learn how to learn. I can do this. And so I said, oh, all right. So, you know, I felt as though I was, I was really given, a, I mean, that's just a sort of an extreme example, but I, I felt it, I was sort of the first woman almost every, on every one of these boards. And the thing that made me feel really good is when I left, all these boards had at least two or more women, sometimes three. Now, that's not a huge number, but at least I didn't mess it up too badly for the next crowd. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't know, I, I really rather loved being the only woman. <laughs> Maybe that's a terrible thing to say, but it was, you know, people, they were very courtly and very, very nice. And, you know, I, just, I really enjoyed it. I had a good time doing it. It's not right for there to be. In fact, I think the women that are coming along now that are being chosen for these boards are probably a good deal better prepared than I would have been. I mean, if I'd had a math major or if I'd had more accounting, it probably would have been better. But a lot of it is just simply common sense. You know, a lot of does this acquisition make any sense? You know, you listen to what everybody said. And so I did have the chance to do a lot of that before I became the chairman and CEO. And all I can think is that my, you know, my style was so different from my husband, who is a handsome, virile, wonderful, top-down manager. And it was his company, and it was his way of the highway. And nobody wondered about what they were supposed to do. They were told what to do. Well, of course, that's just not my way. I like to hear what everybody at the table has to say. And I found I didn't have any trouble making a decision once I heard what everybody had to say. But what I really was not prepared for is how upsetting it was to those whose ideas you did not take. And I learned that you really have to go around and sort of stroke the people that, whose ideas you did not take and say, look, I really value you. I just didn't think it worked for this, but let's keep talking. You know, let's, you know, you're a very important part of the team because you can't, you can't if you have conflicting things, you can't, um, you know, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice. So um, I, I learned, and I think I got better at it as time went on, but um, <clears throat> there were a lot of things that, um, were style-wise that were sort of a challenge. For instance, we had some property down on the river where we had our barges bringing in sand. It was sand for ready mix and asphalt. That was one of our divisions. And at the foot of the main street in, in Nashville, we were on the other side of the river. Well, all of a sudden, they decided, the mayor, of, then the mayor of Nashville decided that there should be a professional football team and that there should be a stadium and it should go right there. Well, that's not what we wanted to do. I mean, we really wanted to stay there because it was near the interstate. It was easier for our barges to get to that site. Although we did have another site down the river, we could, my husband actually had bought just in case we ever got run out by a bigger project. But you know, we had thought we were maybe going to put a five-star hotel or something there instead. Well, this happened soon after my husband had died, and um, the people working for us said, well, we're not going to let the city get away with this. They're condemning our property to put in this uh, ridiculous football stadium. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to take the first box on the 50-yard line, and we're going to win over the mayor's support because they were offering us a very small uh, price for what the land was worth and the, the cost of moving to another location. And, you know, they, the, and, our, and our people were rightfully very upset about that. But I said, let's win, it over. Let's win them over because, you know, if, if we cooperate with them, take a box, our people are going to love it and we will end up getting most of the money. Well, that's what ended up happening. Well, you know, at first, I think our people, mo they were, I think, all men at that point, and uh, they thought I was a little bit too soft, but we ended up winning. So, you know, they had to get used to a different style, and I had to get used to, you know, dealing with these men who wanted to fight and, <laughs> made, you know, play nicely. 
And, uh, but I knew the mayor from some other you know, projects in the community, and I thought he would be reasonable if we didn't try to block him, if he didn't have to fight us in court to get our property. And so we now have the Titans. You ever watch Titans on television? They've had a very bad year this year, but the, it's, it's turned out to be a good thing for the city. It's, it's a unifier in many ways. People from all walks of life, you love to come to the games. And, so we have our box on the 50-yard line, and <laughs> we got our business transferred, and it, it, it you know, was, we came out all right on that. So that's just the kind of thing that's, you know, was very different management style, and I wasn't doing it to be different. I mean, I just had to be comfortable in my own skin and, you know, the way I was used to doing things. And it's, it worked along fine, and actually, I had been there for 16 years, and it just turned out it was 16 more years that I was the chairman and CEO before I turned it over to my sons. They were in their early 30s when their father died, and so they, you know, it was a sizable company with lots of borrowed money, and, you know, as the boys, my son said, um, mother, the bankers aren't going to want to just deal with a bunch of 30-year-olds with, you know, this kind, these kinds of loans. So you give us gravitas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I t it turned out, you know, it was, it was really enjoyable. But, you know, it's, um, I think it's the, the fact that they're not more women, I think it's just, it's, it's just the habit. It was just the way it was done. It was an old boy network, but I never really felt, um, I, I never, I don't know, I just never felt bad about it. I felt uh, somehow it was okay. I mean, it was. I mean, they never were. I never felt diminished in any way. Do you think things are changing? Oh yes, I definitely Good. think they're changing, hugely. And I think there are going to be more and more women doing things like that. But I think that listen, that once women get a chance to show how they how they think and how they do, you know, most times they're hugely successful. And I don't mean necessarily in dollars, just in getting along and listening to what's going on. I think, um, generally speaking, I think women are, are better listeners. I think they tend to want to be consensus builders, and and I think that's a big uh, a big plus. Well, I think your example of you and the city mothers being able <laughs> to get together to create the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, and you look at yeah. the history in Charleston, the preservation movement was started by women here. Absolutely. You know, all of the things that really have affected the culture have been started by women. Mm -hmm. um, but go back a little bit to your philanthropy. Uh, we actually do a program every year where we talk about women in philanthropy, and what is it that you look for in an organization that you might want to support? What kind of management, what kinds of leadership, what, what is, what is your, your gold standard for what you support? Well. My gold standard really, it has to be something I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. And I like to, I don't like to just throw money at things. I like to um, see that the money goes as it's supposed to. And I will say also that my, my children, the you know, three sons and one daughter, I've divided up what we're in a position to give away. When we took this Ingram Micro public, we were able to do things that we'd not been able to do before because we had the very low basis stock that we could give away and uh, do a lot for Vanderbilt and do a lot for the arts. But they and, and, and I, we all agree on this, is that we like to be involved. It's got to be something that really we're interested in. And it doesn't mean that we don't do small things around the community, but the big things, it's, we're, we're in there rolling up our sleeves to get involved. And with at Vanderbilt, for instance, um, my my husband had been chairman of the board at Vanderbilt when he at the time of his death, and then I became chairman. There was one after him, and, and then they asked me to do it. But um, all of my children have got some particular interest at Vanderbilt. You know, one is in, in just just spends so much time at the cancer center. I mean, it's sort of his way of dealing with his father's death. Although he's now fifty some odd years old. And then the, the, the next one is very involved, loves the football team. Now, I don't know if any of you follow college football, but Vanderbilt has come out of the cellar. <laughs> when I was chairman, I kept thinking, if we could just get rid of 
football altogether. It would be, but then I thought this board of trustees would hand me my head on a platter, and that would be the end of that. I felt the same way about the sororities and fraternities because so many people get hurt in those sororities. But we've done things to mitigate that, and that's kind of a whole other story. But um, then um, I have a son who is very interested in the business school. He spends a lot of time there. And then my daughter is uh, the one who really brought the visual arts center, it's called Studio Arts, to, um, to Vanderbilt. And she is in charge of, was in charge of putting all that together. So they've all, it's been sort of this great umbrella over our family, that, uh, and, but each one had sort of an assigned amount of money that he could invest or she could invest. And, so they, they've each followed their own star. And then outside of that, and other things in the community, and we do everything from the humane shelter to cancer treatment centers. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes the conversations at dinner are not things you'd probably want to hear. Why, why do you spend all that money on the humane dogs and things when there are human beings over here that need to have the care and the help? So that, those are not always pleasant, but <laughs> but it's well, you know it's pretty normal. I mean they all have their their major interest in there all, but they get into it and make it happen. You know they don't just uh, throw the money at it. Well, you so. set a great example. Well, I, I grew up with a great example. Mm -hmm. You know my parents were involved in it, and actually my husband's parents were very involved in philanthropy and. Uh, so you know when you get when you get into it, it's it's so it's so wonderful to see the changes that you can make, and it's uh, I sometimes think that we work as hard as we do to be able to give more money away <laughs> to the things that we really believe in, and uh, rather than just literally going to the beach and staying there. But it's much more satisfying to um, have these you see these things happen. And that takes me back to the Gidyard. Would you like to know more about yes, that? Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Go right ahead. Well, it's just, uh, I think it's going to be a game changer for the city. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it, you know, for, for a lot of reasons. But the, first of all, it was a terrible facility. But we, and doing the whole thing, you know, the whole thing's been blown up now. They were going to just scoop it out and then put a, a new interior. But it was so badly put together and so much asbestos. They saved a million and a half dollars by just tearing the whole thing down. And um, so we're going to have a state-of-the-art, beautiful, beautiful theater that's going to go there. You all will not believe that you're in Charleston when you see this. I can promise you it's going to be something that you'll shake your heads. And I, not one of you will walk in with that saying, wow, I didn't think I'd ever see this in Charleston. These same architects did one for us in Nashville. And I loved just standing by the front door, particularly when it was first open. Everybody came in and said, wow. I mean, it was almost as though they were programmed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to do this. The other thing that's going to be so remarkable about this place is that there was an ex is an exhibition hall, or there was. It, too, has been stripped out. It's going to become a beautiful ballroom. And it's divisible by three. So, that it, but it's going to have fabric on the walls. It's going to have molding. It has beautiful over doors. It's going to have a huge catering kitchen. No more cement and, floor. No, <laughs> it'll be carpeted. Maybe over the cement floor, right. but it'll be carpeted. But it, currently, there's nothing downtown that can even approach the size of the events. I mean, if the American Bankers Association were to want to meet in Charleston. They could have their meeting in the theater, and then they could have 1,500 people for lunch or dinner afterwards, or the XYZ company. So, it, I mean, Charleston is already, as we all know, a, a great destination, and, but it's been, it's been inhibited from being able to have the large things. And people want to come to Charleston because, it, well, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, um, this facility is going to be, it, it's going to be suitable to be included uh, with the beautiful buildings that are already here that have been redone. And I like to think that it's sort of a renaissance for, or part of the renaissance for Charleston that is going to really, it's going to stop people in their tracks. And the only thing I guess we need to worry about is there may be still more people on the streets, <laughs> more tourists which some of my friends resent. <laughs> They're rushing to an appointment somewhere, and they said, we can't get around these carriages. And can't. But it's, um, 
it's Charleston, I think, is already the number one destination city in America, knocking uh, San Francisco out of the box. So, you know, when when this is there as well, it's going to be it's going to be quite remarkable and and beautiful, and I think everybody would be very very proud of it. Well, you've had your hand on a lot of projects here and in Nashville and a lot of other places, and I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you for all you've done for our community and our world around us. 